Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, there's avian flu news. The USDA tells us what it's found so far in its test of wild migratory birds. Mississippi 4 Hers learn about the business world while touring cooperatives in the state. You've heard the saying, it's sweet as honey. Natasha will have some ways you can use honey in your everyday food preparation. In Southern Gardening, meet a couple that not only attracts butterflies to their landscape, they grow them as well. In the markets, farm payments could be smaller if a federal budget isn't in place by September 30th. Good news for propane users, there's a record amount in storage. In the feature segment, Mississippi State University is known for its play on the football field, but it's also known for its turf grass expertise. This ryegrass blend is actually an 80-20 blend of perennial rye and chewing red fescue. We have to do it, as you can see, I'm in the shade. Uh, it's hard to grow Bermuda grass or any grass in the shade, and this jumbotron shades out pretty much all of this south end zone. Good day everyone, I'm Amy Taylor. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. There's some good news on southward march of avian flu. Well, the U.S. Department of Agriculture reports so far there doesn't seem to be any spread of avian flu by wild migratory birds. There's been concern that migrating birds could spread it as they fly south this fall. The USDA said that it's collected 6,000 samples from wild migratory birds since July. All of those have been negative for highly pathogenic avian influenza. The positive results, however, don't mean that the re do not mean that the virus is gone. Dr. T.J. Myers said the avian flu virus has the ability to mutate and combine with other viruses. Myers warned growers to not let up on biosecurity efforts this fall. It's still possible for the disease to reappear. Valuable knowledge and skills are developed each year at the 4-H Cooperative Business Leadership Conference. A select group of high school 4-H and FFA members is taken behind the scenes to see how various cooperatives are run and how they serve the community. The three-day event is hosted by Mississippi State University Extension. Um, by combining learning activities with business cooperative tours around Mississippi, the 4-H Cooperative Business Leadership Conference is preparing participants to become young professionals. Marissa Ludaudio of Alcorn County describes the many important skills she's learned. One of the workshops we attended taught us how to create a resume and how to have proper online etiquette, which is really important, especially for my generation, because a lot of people don't realize how important social media is and so they post everything online and it impacts them for years down the road. And so learning how to properly send an email and how to have the right punctuation and grammar and how to present yourself through the way you dress and talk and act in such a way that people respect you and would like to work with you was a very valuable skill that I will use for the rest of my life. Dr. Laura Lemons, Agricultural Leadership Specialist with Mississippi State University Extension, says these young people are making professional connections for the future. The largest benefit for these students at this particular conference is the net networking that they get out of it and the understanding of the opportunities and the career options that they have, um, whether they, have, they maintain a specific interest in agriculture or it's something tangential to that, um, like for instance yesterday when we were at Staple Cotton and we talked a lot about you know, accounting degrees and marketing degrees and human resources and management. Whether they recognize it now or not, that's probably one of the best things that they got out of this conference. Various businesses were included in the tours, such as Farmers Grain Terminal in Greenville and Staple Cotton in Greenwood, as well as Delta and Pine Land Company in Scott. I'm Amy Taylor reporting. Honey is a popular natural sweetener that's been used for centuries. Most people don't know, however, there are a variety of ways you can incorporate it in your daily diet. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes with Mississippi State University Extension gives us more reasons to pour on the honey.
Farmers appreciate the bees that pollinate the plants that gives us our favorite foods. But let's face it, we're all about the honey. Everyone knows honey is delicious on a hot biscuit, but it's also great for sweetening coffee, smoothies, and even your morning cereal. Honey is a favorite natural sweetener. Just keep in mind that it is still a carbohydrate, which means it has calories. That said, raw honey is filled with beneficial antioxidants, minerals, and enzymes. And these enzymes, which are added to nectar by the bees themselves, help your body to absorb and digest sugars more easily. So try using it instead of plain white sugar in some of your favorite baking recipes. It's not an exact substitution, but adjusting the amount of liquid ingredients should leave your recipe tasting as sweet as honey. Personally, I love to eat honey before exercising for that quick energy boost that will help me power through my workout. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Honey can also be used as a binder and a thickener for sauces, dressings, marinades, and dips. Many gardeners grow plants to attract butterflies. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman tells us about a gardener who grows his own butterflies. Most gardeners I know try to keep caterpillars from eating their gardens. Today I'm visiting my friend Tim, who doesn't mind the caterpillars. In fact, he encourages their consumption of his plants. You see, Tim is a farmer, a butterfly farmer. He provides an array of butterfly attracting plants for the caterpillars to consume, for their job is to eat. From passion vine for the gulf fritillary, milkweed for the monarchs, and Reuben fennel for the swallowtails. These plants are the preferred forage for the different varieties. Twice a day, all summer long, Tim and his wife Janet check the various plants for eggs the butterflies have left behind. When they find one, a mesh bag is placed over the plant. Once the egg hatches, this mesh bag provides protection from predators as the caterpillar goes through its growth stages. Once the caterpillar produces its pupa, also called a chrysalis, Tim removes it from the bag and takes it to his butterfly house. After 10 to 14 days, the caterpillar finishes the magical transformation process called metamorphosis and emerges a butterfly. Tim releases them back to the wild for their job now is to mate and start the cycle all over again. If you're interested in attracting butterflies to your Mississippi garden, see the Mississippi State University Extension publication, Butterfly Plants and Mississippi Butterflies. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Artists, annuals are wonderful butterfly plants because they bloom continuously throughout the season and they provide a steady supply of nectar. Avoid double flowers because they are often uh, for showiness and not for nectar production. Mm -hmm. In our feature segment today, see why Mississippi State University knows how to grow turf grass as well as play on it. And now it's time for the markets with Artist Ford and you can see he's filling in for Leighton Span, who is not with us today. So you say there is ample production, uh, ample supply for propane users this winter. That's right, Amy, and a lot of it is located in the Gulf region of the United States. In fact, the United States has record propane supplies as we enter the fall. The U.S. egg market may recover by summer's end of next year, and the federal government is out to cut food waste by half in the next 15 years. Earlier on Farm Week, you heard in the news segment how avian flu has not been found so far in migratory birds. Earlier this year, avian flu hit egg producers hard in the Midwest, and there's fear it could spread to the South this winter. Politico reports that egg industry watchers believe it will take 12 to 15 months to recover from the birds that were lost. Egg consumption was at a 30-year high when the flu hit in the winter in the Midwest. Now, eggs have undergone an image transformation into a health food, and it's hoped that the high demand will return in spite 
of high prices caused by the avian flu outbreak. Federal farm payments for the 2014 crop year could be smaller if the Congress fails to reach a budget agreement. Brownfield got that news from Jonathan Coppice of the University of Illinois. Coppice says that if the Congress does not come to a budget agreement by the end of September, the dreaded sequester will be invoked by the Office of Management and Budget. He says the sequester could decrease farm payments by 7%. Besides decreasing payments, the sequester would probably cause payments to be delayed as well. That's time for today's trivia quiz on Farm Week. And our question is about the bragging rights for agricultural sales in Mississippi. Now you have to put on your thinking cap for this one. What was the top county in Mississippi for agricultural sales in 2012? That's the most up-to-date information that we have. Is the answer, <clears throat> excuse me, Leake County, Bolivar County, Sunflower County, or Scott County? I'll have the answer at the end of today's market segment. We're going to pause now for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Artist Ford reports a record amount of propane is in storage at, in the United States. In the feature segment today, Mississippi State is known for playing football on natural turf, but MSU is also known for turf grass, science, and management. Each year, many Mississippians are seriously injured or killed when farm tractors overturn. One cause of these accidents is improper hitching. If a tractor is hitched at any point above the drawbar, it can flip over backwards. Never hitch a tractor using the bar between the three-point hitch upper and lower links or at the top link attachment point. The stationary drawbar is the only safe location for tractor hitching. A message from the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. Interested in keeping your water well clean and pure? A water well workshop will take place Tuesday, October 13th in Kapaya County. The location is the Kapaya County Extension Office in Hazelhurst on West Gallman Road. The hours are 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. You'll learn about how to test your well and how to protect it from contamination. It's the largest event of its kind in the southeast. The Fall Flower and Garden Fest take takes place in Crystal Springs Friday and Saturday, October 16th and 17th. The location is the Truck Crops Branch Experiment Station of Mississippi State University. Take exits 65 or 68 off I-55 and follow the signs. The hours are 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. There's no admission fee and there will be acres of landscape and vegetable plants to browse. MSU scientists are also going to be available to answer your questions. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now let's check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. We talk a lot on Farm Week about the cost of agricultural commodities being produced by farmers. There's a lot of food grown in the United States, but unfortunately a lot of it is wasted. This waste occurs on farms, in processing, stores, restaurants, and at home. The federal government has embarked on a plan to reduce food waste by one half in the next 15 years. Several food-related organizations joined the USDA and EPA in announcing the goal of a 50% reduction in food waste by the year 2030. USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack says the United States throws away 133 billion pounds of food every year, or 31 percent of the supply. USDA officials say a reduction in the discarded edibles by just 15 percent would save enough food to feed more than 25 million people every year. The USDA and EPA hope that by reducing the amount of food we throw away, improvements will be made to the overall food security of the nation and will benefit the environment. According to the EPA, each year 30 million tons of unwanted fruits, vegetables and other items are disposed of in landfills. As that food decomposes, methane is produced, which is a leading greenhouse gas emission. The standards reduction introduced was grown from a program started in 2013. Designed as an idea exchange, the U.S. Food Waste Challenge invited all facets of the food industry to share their best practices for recycling, recovering, and reducing the unwanted surplus. 
the 4,000 partnerships, from charitable and faith-based organizations to food processors and farmers, share their best practices for confronting the problem. Those ideas are then passed along to others in the food industry with the goal of getting the excess to those in need. Other resources to help meet these first-time goals include educational tools at the USDA website and a social media app. Those resources help consumers learn how to store food more safely and better understand food labels, which can be misleading when trying to discern between sell by and use by. Along with these initiatives, the USDA and EPA are encouraging the private food service companies, such as grocery stores and food manufacturers, to implement their own food waste reduction goals. With help from every corner of the foodstuffs industry, government leaders hope that in 15 years to have reduced the amount of food going to waste in the U.S. by 65 billion pounds, with the end goal of providing more chances to solve food insecurities for those in need. Farmers and homeowners who depend on propane may have an easier time this winter. The U.S. Energy Information Administration says supplies of propane and propylene are at record levels. The EIA says that the inventory reached almost 98 million barrels as of September 11th. That's the highest in the 22 years this statistic has been kept. The increase in inventories occurred the most in the Gulf Coast region. Besides its fuel uses, propane is also used to manufacture ethylene and propylene, which are both key ingredients in the making of chemicals and plastics. Well, it's time for the answer to today's trivia quiz on Farm Week. We wanted to know what county in Mississippi can claim to have the most agricultural sales. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the answer is Leake County. That's where Carthage is located northeast of Jackson on Highway 25. It sold $283 million worth of agricultural products in 2012. Poultry and timber are among its biggest. A lot of work goes into maintaining the beautiful green turf we watch our favorite sports being played on. Good sports turf must not only be pretty to look at, but must also be safe to run on and rugged enough to withstand heavy foot traffic. Mississippi State University has an undergraduate turf grass program and extension specialists who dedicate their careers to researching and producing the best grasses for sports turf, home lawns, and roadsides. This story first aired on Farm Week last fall. When you visit a stadium or sports field to watch your favorite teams play, probably the last thing you think about is the grass they play on. But turf quality is one of the most important factors to ensure everyone's safety and also keep the facility looking presentable. Mississippi State University Extension Service turf grass specialist Dr. Jay McCurdy says the turf business plays a large role in Mississippi's industry. Mississippi has about two and a half million acres of turf. About two million acres of that is roadside, so it's not really fine turf. I deal mainly with the other half million or 500,000 acres of turf. Uh, a majority of that is home lawns. Some of that is also sports fields, recreation fields, parks and rec. Uh, and also includes high maintenance facilities. A lot of folks don't know that a majority of the turf grown in the state of Mississippi for sod is actually produced by family owned farms. There's about 65 farms spread out uh, around the state of Mississippi. It's a locally grown product, as locally grown as you can get. Dr. McCurdy says Davis Wade Stadium is sodded with Tifway 419 Bermuda grass, a warm season grass commonly found in the southeastern United States. Chris Hussey, manager of Hussey Sod Farm in Tupelo, explains why Bermuda varieties are chosen for athletic fields, golf courses, and parks and rec. Bermuda grass is a rugged grass. It, it can withstand lots of traffic, and even if you do have traffic damage, if you stay off of it, you can, it'll recover and, and grow back in a lot quicker. Hussey says Bermuda is a warm season grass, so it phases out in the fall. Therefore, MSU Sports Turf Superintendent Brandon Harden says it's important to add in ryegrass, which grows during fall and winter. It's definitely year round nowadays. You're not going to grow Bermuda grass into November very long anyway and keep it looking the way we want it to look. So we add in the ryegrass. This ryegrass blend is actually an 80-20 blend of perennial rye and chewing red fescue. We have to do it, as you can see, I'm in the shade. Uh, it's hard to grow Bermuda grass or any grass in the shade and this Jumbotron shades out 
pretty much all of this south end zone. Hardin says the material beneath the grass is mostly sand, which creates a safe, well-drained, level surface that can still be played on in the rain. And after a game, immediately recuperating the field is key. These fields are built to take that abuse, take that rain, move that water, and still keep a good, safe, soft but firm playing surface that has very good footing. As you saw in the Auburn game, it didn't tear up, it didn't chunk out, it held and did what it was supposed to do. We use 419 Bermuda grass because it recuperates at a pretty high rate. And it might not be the fastest, but it does what we need it to here. Um, we push it from the time that game's over with, we mow it, clean it up, get as much of the, the debris and everything off the field that we can, of course trash and everything too. Then we will come back down with some more ryegrass seed, very light just to help fill in the divots. A uh, little more ryegrass and then fertilize and we will pound it with water to help try to get this recuperation back you know, as fast as we can from week to week. By now, you're probably wondering if there's a way to save some money by just planting grass instead of purchasing sod. Chris Hussey says that's more complicated than it seems. One of the main misconceptions is folks don't realize that most of the grasses we have are vegetative hybrids and you have to have sprigs or plugs. It's not a quick and easy process to grow in from sprigs. If you do decide to plant, that it's almost like taking care of a, a new child at the house. You know, you have to water it, nurture it, and take care of it to ever get it to the point to where if you put the money in on the front end, you can instantly have a have a lawn that that you desire. Hussey emphasizes that even sod requires some regular maintenance. In the spring, he plants the grass from sprigs or plugs, which are basically small patches of grass with roots established. Depending on the variety, it can take three months to a year before it's harvested for sod. Hussey has a roll cutting machine that cuts the sod and rolls it up so it can be unrolled onto large fields. Additionally, Dr. Jay McCurdy says research is continuously underway to develop new grass varieties and management practices. Our turf program has a dedicated turf grass breeder. His name is Mr. Wayne Philly. Uh, Wayne has developed a number of different cultivars, including the Bermuda grass cultivar that is on the Rose Bowl every year. Uh, that is actually Mississippi Choice, commonly called Bullseye Bermuda grass. We've also got a number of different grasses which are under contract with uh, folks like Sod Solution and Turf Grass Group, and they're actually developing those for commercial turf use. A number of those are dwarf Bermuda grasses for putting greens and for use on golf courses. We're also developing things like St. Augustine grass for shade tolerance and for cold tolerance. Dr. McCurdy says you're unlikely to get your own yard looking like a sports field, but you can maximize lawn quality with some simple tips. Some tips are to get your soil tested regularly, to look at adjusting pH of the soil with lime or with sulfur, it depends what the pH is. Applying to fertilizer recommendations, which can be found at msucares.com. Uh, in our publication, which is Establish and Manage Your Home Lawn, uh, is a great place to start. Additionally, turf grass and landscape professionals, or anyone interested in the turf industry, is invited to join the Mississippi Turf Grass Association. Brandon Hardin says the industry offers fulfilling opportunities to those interested in running a high quality lawn care business, becoming a sports turf professional or specialist. The undergraduate turf grass program at MSU offers the hands-on experience and education students need for building lucrative careers. It's one of the best, I dare to say in the South, but in the entire country. Um, we might not have the numbers everybody else does, but if you look around just the southeast at the amount of superintendents, right now just off the top of my head, I can think of three superintendents in the SEC for sports turf. That, that speaks volumes for, for our program here. As MSU celebrates its 50th year of offering the turf grass program, the future looks bright for developing new ways to meet the needs of consumers in the industry. From Mississippi State University, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. You can watch this feature story again on the Turf Grass Program at Mississippi State on our Farm Week website, Facebook page, or YouTube. We'll have the contact information for the Golf and Sports Turf Management Program, as well as how to get in touch with uh, Jay McCurdy if you need some help with your turf grass. And we're also available at twitter.com slash farmweek. Now, Amy, I, the researchers told me one time they go out and look for Bermuda grasses in the wild. Well, one of the places they like to look 
country cemeteries because, <laughs> you know, they're not taken well care of. And if a grass can yeah. do well there, then, you know, they feel like they can bring it back to campus and maybe turn it into a grass that could be on a turf field one day. So, uh -huh. yeah, so believe it or not, some of the mm -hmm. grasses that Mississippi State has developed were originally found in cemeteries. All so. the more reason to go see your grandmother. And the fact that three SEC schools have MSU grads in charge of their turf grass, that just shows that we do have some expertise. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, it'll be a special one for us. We'll start our 39th season on Farm Week. You'll see the first feature story to air on our show. It's about a cattlewoman who didn't know the meaning of the word retirement. In the food factor, sports drinks, they have their purpose, but not everyone needs them all the time. In Southern Gardening, Rusty Pockets. See how one homeowner is using theirs to showcase their antique collection. For the rest of the Farmer Crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Amy Taylor. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you again next week.